things that I read on Wikipedia today. There's a bug in my cup. I got some good ones for you boys. Today I read about the Concorde, which was a joint plane built by the British and the French, and it was one of the fastest supersonic transport planes ever made. What was crazy about these planes is the average flight from New York to Paris is about seven hours. On the Concorde, it was done in three and a half. This plane cruised at 60,000 feet and flew up to Mach 2, which is 1,350 miles an hour. Most planes nowadays are about 500 miles per hour. A total of 20 of these planes would be built and the majority of the flight was limited to transoceanic only because of the sonic booms that would get generated when the plane broke the speed of sound twice. The design of the Concorde was very interesting because it had these giant delta wings where on normal aircraft on the tail section you have horizontal stabilizers that have the elevators. That's what controls the pitch of the aircraft. Uh, but on the Concorde, the elevators and the ailerons, ailerons control the roll, right? You got pitch, roll, and then yaw. They were combined on the wings and it was because it worked at supersonic travel. I think it's crazy because the Concorde was manufactured between 1965 and 1979. And when you go down here to the design, you can read about all the the computers and some of the technology that they had in the plane at the time. This is cool. The Concorde was the first airliner to have analog fly-by-wire flight controls. This thing had a complex air data computer for automated monitoring and transmission of aerodynamic measurements. The Concorde's air intake control units made use of a digital processor for intake control. It was the first use of a digital processor with full authority control of an essential system in a passenger aircraft. The Concorde had no APU or auxiliary power unit, so the Concorde could only visit large enough airports that had a portable ground power unit available. I didn't know that, that's interesting. Due to the jet engines being highly inefficient at low speeds, Concorde burned two tons of jet fuel just taxiing to the runway. <laughs> Due to the high thrust produced with the engines at idle, only the two outer engines were to run after landing for easier taxing and less brake pad wear. Interesting. Air compression on the outer surfaces caused the skin of the aircraft to heat up during supersonic flight. Every surface, such as windows and panels, were warmed to the touch by the end of the flight. Besides engines, the hottest part of the structure of any supersonic aircraft is the nose due to aerodynamic heating. The highest temperature that the aluminum alloy used to construct the Concorde could sustain was 127 Celsius or 261 degrees Fahrenheit. As the fuselage heated up, it expanded by as much as 12 inches. The most obvious manifestation of this was a gap that opened up on the flight deck between the flight engineer's console and the bulkhead. Can you imagine flying this thing and all of a sudden it starts expanding and you're like, why do I feel like I'm shrinking? The Concorde had livery restrictions, which a livery is the paint on the outside of a plane, and the majority of the surface had to be covered with a highly reflective white paint to avoid overheating the aluminum structure due to the high speed heating effects. Interesting enough, the Concorde actually had to worry about radiation exposure. The Concorde's high cruising altitude meant people on board received almost twice the flux of extraterrestrial ionizing radiation as those traveling on conventional long haul flights. It was speculated that this exposure during supersonic travels would increase the likelihood of skin cancer. Due to the proportionally reduced flight time, the overall equivalent dose would normally be less than a conventional flight over the same distance. To prevent incidents of excessive radiation exposure, the flight deck had an instrument to measure the rate of increase or decrease of radiation. If the radiation level became too high, a Concorde would descend below 47,000 feet. So not only are the pilots worried about, you know, airspeed, altitude, they had to worry about radiation. Ultimately, the downfall of the Concorde was overruns on expenses and even the construction costs. On July 25th, 2000, Air France Flight 4590 crashed shortly after takeoff with all 109 occupants and four on the ground killed. This was the only fatal incident involving the Concorde and commercial service was suspended until November of 2001. The surviving aircraft were retired in 2003, 27 years after commercial operations began. All but two of the 20 aircraft have been preserved and are on display across Europe and North America. I think we have one in Seattle. I think there's a Concorde in Seattle, but I'm not sure. Let's read about Air France Flight 45... 90. That is a terrifying photo. While taking off from Charles, I, that's a French airport I don't know how to pronounce, Air France Flight 4590 ran over debris on the runway dropped by an aircraft during the preceding departure, causing a tire to explode and disintegrate. 
Tire fragments, launched upwards at great speed by the rapidly spinning wheel, violently struck the underside of the wing, damaging parts of the landing gear, thus preventing its retraction, and causing an integral fuel tank to rupture. Large amounts of fuel leaking from the rupture ignited, causing a loss of thrust in the left-hand side engines one and two. The aircraft lifted off, but the loss of thrust, high drag from the extended landing gear, and fire damage to the flight controls made it impossible to maintain control. The jet crashed into a hotel nearby two minutes after takeoff. All nine crew and 100 passengers on board were killed, as well as four people in the hotel. What it hit was a titanium alloy strip that was part of an engine cowl on a DC-10 that had just previously taken off. The strip that fell off the DC-10 had been replaced at an airport in Israel during a check in June of 2000, and then again in Houston, Texas, uh, a month later. The strip installed in Houston had been neither manufactured nor installed in accordance with the procedures as defined by the manufacturer. What? In 2008, a deputy prosecutor asked judges to bring manslaughter charges against Continental Airlines and its two employees, the mechanic who replaced the wear strip on the DC-10 and the mechanic's manager, alleging negligence in the way the repair was carried out. Continental Airlines, of course, denied the charges and the claim and the claim in court that it was being used as a scapegoat by the BEA, which is the Bureau of Inquiry and Analysis for Civil Aviation Safety. Uh. At the same time, charges were laid out against the head of the Concorde program, the Concorde's chief engineer, the head of the DGAC, which is the Director, Directorate General for Civil Aviation in France. It alleged that the these people knew that the plane's fuel tanks could be susceptible to damage from foreign objects, but, none, but nonetheless allowed it to fly. Hmm. Continental Airlines was found criminally responsible for the disaster and was fined $271,000 in order to pay Air France one million pounds. Pounds? Whatever that symbol is. As for the other people, everyone was cleared of charges pretty much, except the mechanic that replaced the wear strip was given a 15 month suspended sentence. Oh, the convictions were overturned by an appeals court in November of 2012, thereby clearing Continental and the mechanic of criminal responsibility. So, so this was in 1979, almost 20 years before that. The number five and six tires blew out during takeoff in Washington. Fragments thrown from the tires and rim damaged the number two engine and punctured three fuel tanks, severed several hydraulic lines and electrical wires, and tore a large hole in the top of the wing over the wheel well. Another blown tire incident, another blown tire incident, another blown tire incident. In 1988, one of the tires one of the wheels lost 10 bolts and a fuel tank was punctured. Another tire burst, another tire burst. Because Concorde was a tailless Delta Wing aircraft, again, designed due to supersonic requirements, Concorde could not use the normal flaps or slats to assist takeoff and landing and required a significantly higher air and tire speed during takeoff roll than an average airliner. The higher speed increased the risk of tire burst during takeoff. Okay. There's been a ton of documentaries. So if you didn't learn enough from me, you can go and watch these or, you know, whatever. Hey, I read that on Wikipedia. Wild stuff, dude. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, I'm gonna do more of these probably where I just sit somewhere in the world and read. So if you know any cool topics that are worth talking about, post them down below. I'll probably read them. Damn tractor driving by.